So, welcome to this talk. Uh, if it's successful, I hope it to be part of a series called The History of Maths and X. Um, in this case, X is cryptography. I'm going to talk about substitution ciphers from uh, ancient, uh, the ancient world to re the Renaissance in Europe. Um, right, here's a quote from Simon Singh's code book. Uh, this is a very good book if you're interested in this topic. Um, the history of code and ciphers is the story of the centuries-old battle between code makers and code breakers, an intellectual arms race that has had a dramatic effect on the course of history. All sounds very, very dramatic. Right, here we are then. Posi uh, hypothetical scenario. Uh, imagine you keep sending secret messages to your trusted generals, but the enemy seems to know all your plans before you realize them. Uh, are messengers being intercepted on the way? Is one of your messages a double agent passing your secrets to the enemy? Okay. You're planning a coordinated surprise attack, and you must tell your generals without the enemy discovering your plans. They can't know about your surprise attack. Uh, how can you get the message to them so that it can't be read by interceptors? So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about cipher, cipher cryptography. Okay, in cipher cryptography, you have a message, which is what's called the plain text. And this is converted by some process called the cipher algorithm uh, into an enciphered form, which is called the cipher text. Um, the cipher algorithm itself is usually quite well known. It's generally published and people know how to do this process. What makes your cipher special is the key, which is some secret piece of information that's vital to know in order to be able to perform this, this process. Right, here's a little diagram. There's you in the top, right hand, uh, top left hand corner. You write the message, that's the plain text. The cipher algorithm is applied to the plain text. This makes an enciphered message we call the cipher text. This goes over some open channel. What that means is that it may be intercepted along the way. And it arrives at the other end, it's still an enciphered message. The cipher algorithm is applied again to reverse the, the encipherment. You end up with the plain text, which can be read by your generals. Okay. Right. A famous early example of uh, cryptography, use of cryptography, was by Roman Emperor Julius Caesar. Uh, this wasn't the earliest, but it was, it was an early one, and one that has a, he has a cipher named after him. A Caesar cipher is a type of substitution cipher. So the way that you perform a Caesar cipher is that every letter in the plain text alphabet is replaced by a letter N places along in, to give the cipher alphabet. So the key in this case is N, the number of letters that you've shifted by. Okay. Here's an example. Plain case, oh, in, in, in this talk, the plain letters are given in lowercase and the cipher letters are given in uppercase. Always, that's a convention. Here, for this, the key is three. So if you look, A maps to D, which is three places on, B maps to E, C maps to F, and so on. Okay. Um, so we write out a plain text message. Let's take as our plain text message, hello everyone. <laughs> Encipher each letter in turn by looking at the corresponding letter in the cipher translation table. And this gives the cipher text message. Right, so if you look, the first letter is H in your message. H corresponds to K. The next letter is E, which corresponds to H. L corresponds to O. L again corresponds to O again. O corresponds to R, and so on, if I go through a bit quicker. Okay, so down the bottom there we have our enciphered message, which now can't possibly be read by anyone who doesn't know the key. Okay. So, so long as your message recipient knows the key, how many letters you've shifted by, uh, they can build their own copy of the cipher alphabet and decipher the message by going through the algorithm in reverse, simply looking up the, uh, the relevant letters, and then they would get your message back. Hello, everyone. Okay. Now, the problem with the Caesar cipher is that there are only 25 possible alphabets. Because if you think about it, the 26th alphabet is the original alphabet, if you shift around. So, actually, this is, not, this is not going to take you very long to try all 25 alphabets on the message and see which one comes out with something sensible. Um, other cipher systems use less regular methods for generating their alphabets. So you must still have a key so that the person at the other end can decipher the message. Um, because if, if, if you just have a random alphabet, then they, everyone has to carry around a little book that tells them which random alphabet. And if that person gets captured, then that alphabet falls into enemy hands. Whereas if it's some secret piece of information, the person at the other end uh, can generate it more easily. Okay. 
here's an example. So, uh, you can build a cipher using your favorite quote. So here's a quote. This is a quote from Albert Einstein. Uh, Pure mathematics is, in its way, the poetry of logical ideas. Okay, so say you have a, a liking for that quote. You and your generals all learn it. First thing to do is to strip out the repeating letters. Because, obviously, an alphabet contains every letter once and only once. You can't have repeating letters. So, if we say this is our original message, those are the first occurrences of each letter in that message. If we crunch those up, we get this squiggle at the bottom. Okay? Now then, we fill that in as the first however many letters of your alphabet, and then there's a gap at the end. These are the letters that have not been used in your, in your favorite quote. Um, in that case, you just need to fill up that with the remaining letters of the alphabet using some systematic process. So here, I've done that in reverse alphabetical order. So the letters that haven't been used so far are filled in in reverse alphabetical order. So this alphabet is much less predictable than the Caesar cipher, uh, yet it's still simple for both the sender and recipient to, to generate. So you can still sit down and build your own copy of the cipher alphabet and encode and decode messages using it. Okay. Provided you can remember the key phrase. That's the trick. Right, back to our scenario. Your agents have intercepted an enciphered message from the enemy. Given your new knowledge of substitution ciphers, can you decipher the message without knowing the key? Right. Uh, in the 8th century AD, Islamic culture uh, enters a golden age. And at the time, this is the most learned society uh, in the world. Uh, cryptography was routinely used for matters of state. Um, so there's, there's a widespread use of technology, and lot, uh, cryptography, and there's a lot of scholarly activity going on. Uh, this led to the development of cryptanalysis, uh, with scholars using a combination of mathematics, statistics, and linguistics uh, to develop techniques for deciphering messages where the key was not known. So there was a lot of interest at this time in studying the text of the Quran, And uh, in, the, in doing so, scholars had noticed that some letters appear more frequently than others. So if you've, as you write in English, you might notice that you use E and T more often than you do Z and Q, for example. Hmm? Um, and this fact can be used to decipher messages. This is a process called frequency analysis. Right, here are the average letter frequencies in English. I'll leave that up for a second, but the most frequent are E, T, and A, uh, and the least frequent are X, Q, and Z. Hopefully this matches your experience of, of writing English, unless you've been writing some very weird things. <laughs> so further frequency analysis is a bit more to it than that. Pairs of letters are quite likely to be uh, S, S, E, E, T, T, F, F, L, L, M, M, or O, O. If you see a pair of a repeat of letters, it's quite likely to be one of those. If you see a one-letter word on its own, unless abbreviations or, or somehow, if only proper words have been used, uh, the only words in English that are one letter are A and I. So if you see one letter on its own, it ought to be A or I. Uh, Two-letter words are commonly of, to, in, it, be, as, at, so, we, he, by, or, on, do, in that order. So if you've got a long enough message, you can start to do analysis of this. If you see a three-letter word, it's quite likely to be the or and. Not always, but it's quite likely to be. The letter H, this is quite interesting. Letter H goes frequently before E. You can probably think of lots of words. He, the, then, all the theirs, she, you know, all these words with H-E. But it rarely goes after the E in English. There aren't many words that go E-H in them. Uh, and again, uh, well, no pair of letters, no other pair of letters has this asymmetry. So if you can spot something like this, you can start to realize which ones are H and E. Uh, another technique is to use a crib. This is a word or phrase you can guess will be in the message. Okay, so you, you might know that the message is to someone and their name might be in it or reports a certain topic. You might be able to guess some of the words in that topic. Right, let's have an example. Now this, um, I'll put it for a second. Does anyone want to guess at an incitement so far? A <laughs> decipherment. Right, there are lots of Ks. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is a slightly contrived example for the sake of uh, brevity in this talk. If you were really doing frequency analysis, you would expect a lot of guesswork and a lot of dead ends before you end up at the right place. But because K is the most frequently occurring letter here, I'm going to tell you that K is E. E is the most frequent letter in English. Okay? We have a G on its own. Now, we think that must be A or I. Right? G appears quite frequently otherwise in the text. 
So I'm going to tell you that G was A, which is a frequently occurring letter. Okay? If that turns out to give us gibberish, we might go back and think about whether that was an accurate uh, assumption. So this is the message. I've turned the E's and the A's, in, in lowercase E's and A's. These are now letters that we think we've deciphered. So let's have a look next. This is combination ME several times. There is no EN. So again, it's a slightly contrived example. I'm going to tell you this is, this is likely to be HE. Okay? So I'm filling in the letters down the bottom. Let's look at this first word. This first word is HE, and then a repeated letter, and then another letter. We don't know what those are. Now, given that this is the start of the message, do you think that word might be hello? Okay? Let's guess hello. And then I fill in the L's and the O's throughout the rest of the message. This word looks a likely example to me. So if I bring this up, this is now uh, as a crossword. There's a lot of cryptography that's a bit like guessing crosswords. Does anybody want to guess what this, letter might, what this word might be? Example. Very good. Example. There's no other word in English that follows the pattern E something A something something L E that I know of. <laughs> so that gives you now the X's, the M's, and the P's. Well, there aren't many X's, but there are a few M's and P's. Okay, so have you noticed at this point, as we're filling up the letters down the bottom, all the letters are appearing in their alphabetical positions. So particularly if you look at the sequence in the middle, R, S, something, U, V. Yeah. <laughs> and if you look at where the others are, there's the right gaps between each letter. So do we think this might be a Caesar cipher, where the letters are still in the correct order? Let's try it. If we put in a Caesar cipher that corresponds to those letters, we get a message out which makes sense. Okay. So now we know, back to our example, now we know that the key is 6, uh, you can decipher messages, uh, future messages from your enemy. So when you get another message, you know that the same key has been used, you can just decipher it just like that. But you have to be careful what information you act on. Because if you seem to know their plans too much, they might get suspicious. If they get suspicious, they might change their key. Well, it wasn't too hard to find their key from that little message there. But they might change their cipher system, their algorithm. In which case, you might not be able to crack it anymore. So you've got this information coming in, you shouldn't act on it too readily. Uh, you've discovered your enemy is using a simple substitution cipher like your own. You've deciphered one of their messages. If you can decipher their messages using frequency analysis, can they do the same to yours? It's likely they might be able to. So can a better cipher be designed, uh, a cipher that would produce better, uh, greater uh, resistance to frequency analysis? Right. During the Renaissance in Europe, scholarship increased and politics became more complicated. That's a bit of an understatement. <laughs> um, so this contributed to the development of cryptography and cryptanalysis because you end up with, with a lot of people doing very clever work and a lot of governments doing things they would like to keep secret. So you end up with a, a thriving industry. So some methods were developed for countering frequency analysis, uh, including, well, omitting spaces. What that does is it stops you being able to say, oh, that's a two-letter word, that's a three-letter word, we might be able to work out what that is. All those tricks go out the window if you omit spaces. Or if you put in spaces at random. By the way, if you put in spaces to make it look like the wrong sort of message. And then the person at the other end, when they decipher the message, well, they can just they can put the spaces back in fairly easily. Okay? Uh, deliberate misspellings. If when you, when you were going to put S, you put Z... For example, every now and again. When you're going to put N, you put M, things like that. Again, the person at the other end can still read it. It still basically makes sense. But it's going to upset frequency analysis because frequency analysis expects there to be very few Zs and rather more Ss. Nulls. Nulls are characters that have no meaning. So if you insert a lot of characters that have no meaning, your frequency analysis might tell you, well, this is... This is E or T or A, and actually it doesn't mean anything, that character. So that'll, that'll muck up frequency analysis. Um, and there's also, I read about a cipher where there was a character that means delete the previous character. It's quite a nice little trick for, for getting around these things. Um, codes. Well, so far, we've dealt with cipher cryptography, which is uh, individual letter based, changing individual letters for individual letters. What you can also do is codes, which are replacing whole words or phrases with other words or phrases or letters. So if you know you're going to use a phrase particularly often, 
if you're going to put hello, you could replace that with an individual letter, and then you wouldn't be giving it away in quite that same way. Because uh, frequency analysis expects letters to decipher to letters and gets confused by, by individual words. So all these methods helped, uh, but ultimately the cryptanalyst won, and each of these methods could be accounted for. It might take you a bit of time, but if you keep going down a dead end with this one, with, with this one letter, you might decide it might be a null. You'd exclude it from the message and then try again, see if you can break it down to something sensible. Um, you can sometimes start to work out the codes from the context and things like this. So these methods could be accounted for eventually, and a better cipher was needed. Right, in the, uh, in the 16th century emerged a cipher called uh, Visionaire. This uses more than one cipher alphabet. So previously our ciphers have used just the one cipher alphabet. And different letters are enciphered with each of these cipher alphabets in turn. So what this means is that the same plain letter can be enciphered and the same cipher letter can be deciphered in several different ways. And this upsets the frequency analysis. I'll show you an example in a second. Now, your cipher alphabet really must still be generated by some systematic process. Because, again, the person on the other end needs to be able to replicate it. And if you have to give them a big book to look up how your, uh, how your cipher works, then that's a risk if they get caught. So how are we going to do this? Well, let's say you're a keen quantum physicist and you choose a keyword. Uh, we're looking for a keyword that's, that's nice and easy to remember, so uh, poorly. The Caesar cipher alphabets then beginning with those letters are formed. So if you look on the left hand side here, uh, it's the letters that A are, is mapped to, gives us which Caesar cipher to make. So down the left it goes P, A, U, L, I, and A is mapped to each of those letters. If you look at the first one, P, A is mapped to P, and then B is mapped to Q, C is mapped to R, and the alphabet proceeds in order. And this happens for each of them. So now we've generated very easily from a simple little keyword, we've generated five different alphabets. Now, we take as a plain text method, well, we need a plain text method. So I'm going to take the message hello, that's what I'm going to send. Our cipher algorithm is to encode each letter using each cipher alphabet in turn, cycling through the cipher alphabets. So if you watch, here are our cipher alphabets again, P-A-U-L-I. So H is enciphered using the P alphabet, giving W. E is enciphered using the A alphabet, giving E. L is enciphered using the U alphabet, giving F. L is again enciphered, but this time with the L alphabet, giving W. And O is enciphered using the I alphabet, which gives us W. So there's our message, W, E, F, W, W. Now, crucially here, uh, we've done two important things. We've enciphered the two letters L to give different cipher letters, F and W. So that means if you looked at this word, you wouldn't say that there's a, repeat, a repeated character there in the middle. So that's that bit of frequency analysis beaten. And also, we've enciphered different plain text letters, H, L, and O, to give the same cipher text letter, W. So this means that letters that appear in your cipher text very frequently may not be the same letter appearing very frequently. It can be lots of different letters. So that's completely mucked up frequency analysis. We now can't do that because we're using different alphabets for each cipher, uh, for each letter. In turn, uh, through the use of multiple alphabets, uh, basically the chart is, is distorted or flattened, which gives us strong resistance to frequency analysis. Right. The disadvantage of Visionaire um, and multi-alphabet ciphers are that they're more complicated to implement than single-alphabet substitution ciphers. Uh, this adds time taken to encipher and decipher messages. You might be, you've got to imagine you're not using a computer, you're sat with your pen and paper or parchment, and uh, you may be enciphering and deciphering hundreds of these a day. So this, this adds to the time taken, so it's not worth doing, unless you know that your enemy can read your simple substitution ciphers. So it took a bit of time for this to catch on, but eventually it did. Eventually everybody could read everybody's ciphers unless they were using something like this. Um, for many years, the Visionaire cipher had a reputation as the unbreakable cipher. But can it be broken? <laughs> right, so... To find out how, yes it can, to find out how it's broken and how cryptanalysis techniques work on the Visionaire ciphers, uh, you can listen to the companion podcast to this talk, and I would encourage you to do so. Um, this is released by the Institute of Mathematics and its Applications through a podcast called Travels in a Mathematical World. 
uh, as well as the podcast, uh, this talk is accompanied by an article in I Squared magazine. Um, you can find out how to, how to get that uh, and the podcast and other aspects of the history of maths and X output. If I do more talks, they will also be here. Um, uh, at this website, which is historyofmathsandx.co.uk. Uh, right, thank you very much for listening.